Hi, uh, hi, Jakey Steve here, the long-haired freaky dude. Today I'm going to talk about Book 7 of the Histories of Herodotus, named after the muse of sacred poetry, Polymnia, and translated into English by George Rowlinson. Man, holy cow, this book is amazing. It, is, it finally gets into the Battle of Thermopylae, which is just as epic as I thought it would be. And what is more awesome than King Leonidas and the 300 Spartans from the movie 300? Loads of iconic scenes, plenty of incredible fight sequences, and it pleases my soul to know that many of the memorable scenes and memorable moments from the movie indeed actually happened, you know, at least according to the accounts of Herodotus. But more on that later. This book is quite long, the longest of the books of Herodotus' histories. Uh, the second half, it deals with the epic tales of uh, the Battle of Thermopylae, but the first half, it deals with the Persian side and the, 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 how they build themselves up after the, the loss at the Battle of Marathon, and then it lists all the nations who are a part of the Persian's army, kind of akin to the second book of uh, Homer's Iliad. So shortly after Darius and his army retreat from the Battle of Marathon, he dies and does not have the opportunity to exact revenge on the Greeks, so his throne passes over to Xerxes. Now, funny thing about this is that he actually passed his throne over at the advice of a Spartan defector. Uh, Darius chose his firstborn son after he became king, not his true firstborn son, as is a Spartan custom. Just find that kind of ironic. Xerxes didn't care about the Greeks nearly as much as his father Darius did, and actually at the council of his uncle, Artabanus, decides not to pursue the Greeks. While everyone else on his council is telling him to, Artabanus persuades him not to with this argument. Uh, well, first, he, he decides to speak up against everyone's opinion for this reason. It is impossible, if no more than one opinion is uttered, to make choice of the best. A man is forced then to follow whoever advice he may have been given. I like that. He's not scared to voice another idea or another opinion. Uh, but as for his actual argument... Now, suppose some disaster befall thee by land or sea, or both. <laughs> it happens. The slander does wrong for so as much as he abuses a man behind his back and the hearer for as much as he believes that what he has not searched into thoroughly. The man slandered in his absence suffers wrong at the hands of both, for one brings against him a false charge, and the other thinks him an evildoer. Greece is, of course, the slander to which he is referring. Now, Artabanus, he is so firm on this belief that he is even willing to bet his children on the fact that Persia will be crushed by the Greek forces and that Xerxes will suffer defeat. Xerxes hearkens to this council, but, you know, of course, he has a vision in his sleep, a dream, and then he goes to battle with heart and soul against the Greeks. Artabanus gives more counsel. Whatever a man has been thinking during the day is wont to hover round him in the visions of his dreams at night. Thank you! Just because you have a dream doesn't mean it's divinely inspired, okay? But then Artabanus gets the same dream and therefore abandons his counsel against going to war. But really, I think what happened here is that like the king had someone like sneak up to Artabanus' ear while he was sleeping and whisper, Go to war with Greece! And then, you know, that was delicately woven into the fabrics of Artabanus' dreams, those words, okay? But that's just my theory. Xerxes then begins building his army for four years, and he prepares a path for Greece. In doing so, he turns peninsulas into islands, you know, so that his ships can move faster around the area. And he also constructs a bridge which is seven furlongs long. Now a mile is eight furlongs, so dang, that's a pretty darn big bridge. And here we get a huge recount of Xerxes' massive army, which is kind of akin to uh, Homer's listing in the Iliad. It lists every region which has supplied troops to Xerxes' army, along with the type of armor they wore and the weapons with which they were equipped. He then does the same with the horsemen and the ships, the navy. And a funny thing uh, about the horse listing, like, he's just listing all these nations who brought their horses, and then he gets to the Arabs. And the Arabs are just sitting there on their camels. They're like, uh, so, you know, everyone else brought their horses, uh, but you're on camels, you know? I don't know. I find it hilarious. In total, their army accounted to about 1,200 ships and 2.7 million men. Gosh dang, man, that is a huge army. 2.7 million men. I didn't know there was that many people alive back then. They were so big that they literally drank rivers dry. Now, I don't know how you drink a river dry. I mean, you, you grab a cup and then it is replenished by water, water from way up in the streams, you know. So how do you drink a river dry? I sure hope they weren't drinking stagnant water. In this listing, it also briefly mentions a female naval commander named Artizima, who I'm sure comes into play in the Battle of Salamis. We shall see. 
Anyways, this, this big ass army marches forth, and Artabanus, he still has some qualms about this. He thinks that Persia's biggest weakness as an army is that it's too big. The ships won't have anywhere to harbor during a storm, and the troops won't have enough to eat. Xerxes says this about it. I pray thee, fear not to all things alike, for count up every risk. For if in each matter that comes before us thou wilt look to all possible chances, never wilt thou achieve anything. Far better is to have a stout heart always and suffer one share of evils than to uh, be ever fearing what may happen and never incur a mischance. What Xerxes said has some validity. I mean, we have to take chances. Go big or go home, you know? We wouldn't have great things like SpaceX or, or future Mars missions if entrepreneurs like Elon Musk didn't want to take risks. But that doesn't mean that we should avoid those weaknesses and completely overlook at them. We should look at them, analyze them, and find ways to secure those weaknesses so that we have a less chance of something bad happening. Xerxes is just so gosh darn proud of his huge army that he asked if anyone would even dare try to fight it. Now, uh, Demaratus, the defected Spartan counselor who is now on Xerxes' council, gives him a shocking reply that uh, every, every single person in Greece would submit to the Persian yoke, except for the Spartans alone. What wild words, Demaratus! A thousand men will join battle with such an army as this? Xerxes is just finding it hard how a man who is free has something to fight for. Oh, I can't wait for his army to be crushed, that pompous little butthead. Demaratus further proclaims, Law is the master whom they own, and this master they fear more than thy subjects fear thee. That right there, my friends, is beautiful. Freedom is something worth fighting for, and the law is more frightening than their pesky despot Xerxes. How demasculating. The army pushes on. At one point, Xerxes encounters the second richest man in the world, only bested by himself. And this second richest man in the world is so devoted to the Persian cause of slavery. I don't know why anyone would be devoted to the cause of slavery, but whatever. He is so devoted that he gives all of his riches and his entire riches to Xerxes to fund his army. Xerxes is just so bemused by this that he, he tells this man, Hey, I'll give you anything that you want. Just ask. Just ask, man. I'll give it to you. So this man, he does that. He just does what Xerxes tells him. He asks. He's like, Hey, man. Can you at least keep my sons out of war? That's all I ask. I'm giving you my, all my wealth. I'm the second richest man in the world. I just want my sons out of the army. And Xerxes being the hypocrite that he is. He gets so mad that he kills the guy's son right then and there. What a freaking horrible guy, man. I mean, come on. I mean, I, I get why he was angry, because he has 2.7 million other men, uh, children, whose fathers are equally as distressed as this guy about their sons going off to war. But he did tell the guy that he could ask for anything. They passed through Thessaly, which is kind of interesting. It used to be a water basin where all the surrounding rivers would drain into it. And, you know, it'd be a basin. It wouldn't drain anywhere else. But eventually there was a, a crack which appeared in the mountain, and the basin drained out, and that's where Thessaly now is. Xerxes, whenever he was passing by, he remarked that if the Thess Thessalonians had decided to side against the Persians, all that he would have to do is merely plug up this mountain gap and flood them out. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that they've had to plug up a gap. Just after this, he sends more heralds to all the cities of Greece asking them for earth and water. This, of course, symbolizes that that city is giving everything to the Persian yoke. He sends a herald to all the cities except for these two, Athens and Sparta. And man, the reason for him not sending a herald to those places is just so hype. I fangirled all over myself. King Xerxes sent no heralds either to Athens or Sparta to ask earth and water, for a reason which I will now relate. When Darius some time before sent messengers for the same purpose, they were thrown at Athens into the pit of punishment, and Sparta into a well. Ah, yeah! This is Sparta! Ah! Oh man, of all the things that could have been possibly true about that movie, it pleases my soul that a Persian ambassador was actually hurled into a giant gaping pit by a Spartan sandal. I mean, really, I couldn't be more excited. Who doesn't want a giant pit of punishment to be real? Now for Sparta, it says a well, but I mean, come on. A well is just a giant pit of punishment with water at the bottom. It doesn't rule out the fact that there could be spikes or uh, some other arrangement of exciting pointy things at the bottom to disembowel the, the, the poor suspecting person who's falling down there. Either way, my chops were being wet for the greatness to come.
Ironically, Sparta actually killed Persia's ambassador accidentally, uh, whereas uh, the Athens killed him purposefully. So, as an apology, the Spartans sent two of their own people to be killed, and these people, they elected to do it voluntarily to be killed. I volunteer as tribute! On their way to the king, the Persians who are escorting them simply don't understand why the Spartans are doing what they're doing. A slave's life thou understandest, but, never having tasted liberty, thou canst tell whether it be sweet or no. Ah! Hadst thou known what freedom is, thou wouldst have bidden us fight for it, not with the spear only, but with the battle axe. And that brings up a good point. Many of the Persians who are fighting in Xerxes' army don't even know what freedom is. They've been slaves their whole lives. They've just been doing as they've been told to do their whole lives. They don't have anything to fight for, whereas the Greeks do. The ambassadors make it to the king, and they are told to bow before the king, but they refuse to do so. They came there as an apology for killing their ambassador, not to bow down before a man. It was not their custom to worship men, and they had not come to Persia for that purpose. Noble, but he doesn't kill them. He wants to be better than the Spartans. And he also discovered some Greek spies who were trying to scope out his army and such. And he doesn't kill these guys either. He instead shows them his entire army. He shows them everything that he's got and sends them back to Greece with the hopes that they will surrender and cower in fear. But unfortunately for Xerxes, who just doesn't understand how people who have been overcome with freedom like to think, this actually has the opposite effect. Instead of inflicting fear into their hearts and causing them to surrender, they instead are motivated. They build up their army even larger and are prepared to fight Xerxes' 2.7 million men with which he so proudly boasted. Upon hearing this, the Greeks formed a league having many alliances of all the neighboring cities, and they formed a huge army, Sparta having the strongest land force and Athens having the strongest naval force. They already had a lot of ships made thanks to a recent previous engagement with a neighboring city. The Greeks refused alliance with one of the strongest armies of the time because their terms of alliance were this, that in order to be aligned with the Greeks, that they would want to be in control of the entire army and all of their generals. The Greeks were not going to fight one form of slavery by subjecting themselves to another. So, the Greeks set up in Thermopylae and await the Persians coming. The Greeks who at this spot awaiting the coming of Xerxes were the following. From Sparta, 300 men-at-arms. Oh yes, it's about to go down! The various nations had each captains of their own under whom they served, but the one to whom they all especially looked up and who had the command of the entire force was the Lacedaemonian, Leonidas. Ah, <laughs> yes! Leonidas, oh yeah! Now there were actually some other men, but they kind of fled early on, so it really was kind of just the 300s, and some Thebans who Leonidas forced to stay because he was questioning their loyalty. I wasn't sure of it too, because it said earlier on that the, the Thebans had been one of the cities who supplied uh, water and earth to the Persians when they asked, and yet now when they're going to fight, they supply some of their troops, so I was questioning that as well. Fishy playing both sides, and eventually they did turn over to the Persians, so they were traitors. Anyways, Thermopylae is a great place to fight, though. It is a very narrow pass. Uh, Herodotus describes it as so narrow that only one carriage can move through it at a time at some points. 2.7 million men don't mean squat when only a handful can engage in combat at a time. It only prolongs the suffering. Now, the Spartan army should have been much bigger than 300. You know how in the movie, how there's like a big political fiasco about trying to get more troops? That simply isn't described here. The reason is much more stupid. Herodotus says that the only reason the rest of the army didn't come is because they were indulging themselves in the Olympic festival and didn't want to miss out on all the fun. This is freaking war! You're in battle! And you're not gonna do it because you want to attend a festival! Oh my god! The Spartans had tens of thousands of men supposedly equal in skill to the 300, but no! They had to go to the Olympics instead! <laughs> So it was, 300 versus 2.7 million. Xerxes sent a few men to dispose of them, but they were easily killed by the 300, so he kept sending more and more waves, and the 300 just kept mowing down the ranks. So eventually Xerxes sent his finest men, his immortal army, and they too suffered at the hands of the slaughterous 300. In this way it became clear to all, and especially the king, that though he had plenty combatants, he had but very few warriors. 
And these Spartans, man, they could have kept fighting day in and day out because they had the shifts. Uh, they fought in shifts, so they, ne uh, they never grow tired. Slowly but surely, they were shaving off the numbers of the Persian army. But eventually, after two tiring days, a this, this just traitorous fiend named Ephialtes, who, who was a Greek, but he defected to the Persian side. He showed them a route around the mountain so that they could appear behind the 300. This, this is when the rest of the Greeks went home, but the 300 remained. They were going to fight and they were going to die. Leonidas actually told the rest of the men to go home because they would not have the heart to fight and they would only die sooner as a result of that. So when the council had broken up, part of the troops departed and went their ways homeward to their several states. Part, however, resolved to remain and to stand by Leonidas to the last. The Thespians were the only ones who chose to stay and die with Leonidas. And here, we get their last stand, which is just so freaking epic. Now they joined the battle beyond defile and carried slaughter among many barbarians who fell in heaps. Behind them, the captains of the squadrons armed with whips urged their men forward with continual blows. Many were thrust into the sea and there perished. A still greater number were trampled to death by their own soldiers. No one heeded the dying. For the Greeks, reckless of their own safety and desperate, since they knew that as the mountain had been crossed, their destruction was nigh at hand, exerted themselves with the most furious valor against the barbarians. By this time, spears of the greater number were all shivered, and with their swords they hewed down the ranks of the Persians. And here, as they strove, Leonidas fell fighting bravely, together with many other famous Spartans, whose names I have taken care to learn on account of their great worthiness, as indeed I have those of all 300. This is just awesome, but that wasn't even the end. Once Leonidas fell, there was a big fight over the bodies, and once, once the Spartans didn't have any weapons left to fight with, they fought with their hands and their teeth. They were just gnashing and gnawing, and their goal was to kill as many people as they could before they themselves died. They knew that they were going to die, but this did not stop them. This did not discourage them in any way. And they kept on fighting until the very last of the 300 died. Now, they may not have survived the battle, but in my eyes, they won the battle. 300 men, in the end, supposedly took down 20,000, which is incredible. And they probably could have taken down many more, if not for Ephialtes. They, they may have very well held their position until more reinforcements came. Not too dissimilar from the movie. I mean, the movie does have its dramatic adaptations, but I'm glad it does. That makes the movie <laughs> just a whole bunch more awesome. It, it's not meant to be historically accurate. It's meant to be entertaining. And I think that's something that we need to remember whenever we watch movies. Regardless, quite a bit of it was, in fact, inspired by the real true stories here. Disappointingly, toppling a giant wall of dead corpses onto the Persian army was not a battle strategy used. But, I mean, come on, 20,000 people being slaughtered in a narrow pass? So narrow that not, not even two uh, carriages can pass through it at once? I'm sure there must have been something which at least resembled that around there. 20,000 corpses in a narrow pass. Yeah, there, there must have been a wall. And remember that awesome arrow scene at the end where so many arrows are coming at them that it literally blocks out the sun? Such was the number of barbarians that when they shot forth their arrows, the sun would be darkened by their multitude. So yeah, that happened. And a famous reply to this by the Spartan warrior Dionysus. Our Trachinian friend brings us excellent tidings. If the Medes darken the sun, we shall have our fight in the shade. And uh, remember the guy Aristodemus, you know, the guy who lost his eye? Yeah, well, that actually happened too. And he was the only one of the 300 Spartans to survive and return home. At first, he was greatly shamed upon his return home because another who had the exact same condition as him went on to fight and die with the 300s while he returned home. Uh, he was the only one who survived, and this hurt him greatly. But he did uh, greatly redeem himself at the Blatt of, uh, Battle of Platae. Anyways, man, the 300s were savage beast. I'm so glad I finally got to read the original count of their incredibly heroic story. I've always loved their story, man, and it, it's just as epic as you would imagine it to be. Up next, the Battle of Salamis, an equally epic and incredibly outnumbered naval battle. Well, I am Jakey Steve, the long-haired freaky dude. I thank you for watching this discussion of Book 7 of the Histories of Herodotus. The Battle of Thermopylae doesn't get any more awesome than that. Leonidas and the 300s, come on. 
Who doesn't like Spartans? Well, if you want to see more great book reviews like this, I encourage you to check out my channel and hit the subscribe button. There, we're reading through the great books of the Western world, and we're talking about everything that we read. It's fun, fun, informational stuff. Uh, also, I'll be going off to college soon, so if you could, please just check out my GoFundMe, contribute a dollar or two. I will love you forever. Well, I'm Jakey Steve, the long-haired freaky dude. Thank you all for watching this video. See you in the next video. Have a good day.